Last time on High School DD, Issei had just challenged the infamous Riser Phoenix in a fight for the hand of his master, the amazingly powerful high ranking devil, Rias Gremory. Using the power of the Red Dragon Emperor, he's able to claim victory and in turn, Riz his very own master. Moved by his strength and determination, the great devil herself chooses to move in with our hero, leading to many more lewd situations. But the times of peace are only fleeting as a new threat looms over Issei, Rias, and the rest of the Occult Club. Will Issei be able to face this threat, and will he be able to become the Harem King? Tune in now to find out. <laughs> what the fuck? We are back with the latest addition to this new series that I didn't think would be an actual series where I reveal High School DD. Uh, still workshop in the name. But yeah, this is the second part in what will become a season to season review of the very famous ecchi anime High School DD, and I highly recommend you pause this video and go back to watch the first one which you can find right here or in the description below. And speaking of part 1, I just want to take a moment to thank you all for all the views, likes and comments on the first video, it really means a lot and I hope you all will continue to stay with me on this journey throughout the whole series. Alright, alright, that's enough delay on my part. Without further ado, this is High School DD New. Opening up, we are immediately greeted with some Rias fan service, which I legally cannot show. Life has become pretty hectic for Issei since Rias moved in. She and Asia have been butting heads over Issei since they both clearly have feelings for him and want to spend as much time as they can with him. But Issei, for some reason, is still as dumb as a bag of bricks to catch on to this, as if his brain doesn't remember what happened the night he rescued Rias. I will admit, the back and forth between the two girls got a few chuckles out of me most of the time, which I guess is mostly due to the English voice acting. So the Occult Club gang will be meeting up that same day, however due to the fact that their club room will be having its spring cleaning, Rias decides to have said meeting in Issei's house. The rest of the day is pretty standard for Issei, getting into the usual pervy antics with his friends, however we do get introduced to a new character. Her name is Aika, and she looks a little too well designed to be a background character. I'm calling it now, she's either going to become pretty relevant to the plot later, or is actually secretly a bad guy. Issei's time with them is cut short when his left hand starts to throb. If you recall, in the last season, he gave his left hand to the red dragon in order to get that super cool transformation, but due to that, his left hand permanently has the gauntlet on. But thanks to Akino's magic, he's able to keep it hidden during the day. But every now and then, the magic builds up, which means he needs an emergency visit from her. So he does get to meet her and according to the logic of the anime, the best way to do this is by sucking the magic out of his arm. And how does she do it? By literally sucking it out of his arm. And this is as sexually charged as it looks. Aside from being pure fan service, this scene also shows us something new in Akino's character development. During the team fight with Riser and his servants, she watched Issei continue to fight when the odds were against him, and watching him storm the engagement party and actually beat Phoenix made her fall for him. And now she wants to get in on that Issei action too. Even more so than the rest because she knows what she's doing is behind Rias' back. So school's over and the gang gets to meet up in Issei's room to hold their meeting, but it doesn't take long before his mom barges in with a photo album to show off to all his friends. All the ladies are enjoying the many baby photos of Issei, but Kiba on the other hand looks rather grim. In one of the photos has Issei, another kid and a very distinct looking sword. But that isn't just any sword, it's a holy sword, and Kiba seems very into it. Later that night, Issei is out running devil errands. This time, he's been summoned by a man. Now he looks a little too well designed to be a background character. Calling it now, he's either going to become pretty relevant to the plot later, or is actually secretly a bad guy. Hell, maybe even both. This mystery man who summoned Issei wants nothing more than to just have a drink and chat. I guess stranger danger isn't a thing here. But Issei's visit is cut short when he and the rest of the Occult Club get an emergency request to take out a stray devil. So they all team up and fight it out but Kiba isn't exactly focusing on the fight and because of that slip up, almost caused them to fight. Rias isn't too pleased with this and scolds him but she's also worried about him. Something is weighing down on his mind and Issei tries to get him to talk about it but Kiba isn't exactly budging. He leaves with a few words. Kiba tells Issei that he's recently remembered his purpose, the reason why he's alive, and that is revenge. Revenge against the holy sword, Excalibur. This is when Rias gives us a bit of backstory on Kiba and what exactly a holy sword is. 
Holy swords are the strongest weapons against devils. A simple cut could completely obliterate a devil. They are so powerful that only a select few can attune to these swords and actually wield them, and they are pretty hard to find. But this wasn't going to stop the church. They ran experiments where they attempted to artificially create people with a factor that let them wield holy swords, Excalibur especially. This was called the Holy Sword Project. And as you can imagine, it was incredibly inhumane and gruesome. Worst of all, the project failed, and Kiba is the only survivor. Rubbing minds together, they figure out what triggered Kiba into getting this way, that being the photo of Issei as a kid with that one holy sword in the background. Issei points out how it makes sense now since the kid's family always invited them to church. Meanwhile, in an abandoned church somewhere, two ladies who appear to be part of the church arrive. They seem to be meeting up with a priest, but said priest has just been killed by the crazy rogue priest Freed Zelzen, right in front of Kiba too, who's out sulking in the rain. And as luck would have it, the blade Freed is parading around is none other than Excalibur. Pretty anticlimactic design, but it's a holy blade nonetheless. They fight it out, but it doesn't take long until Freed escapes yet again. I gotta say, this season looks a lot better than the first. Maybe they got a budget increase from all the fat stacks they made showing fat stacks to horny teens, but whatever it is, I'm grateful for it. Character art, movement and action look and feel a lot more polished compared to the stiffness of the first season, making it a lot more pleasing to watch. But where the improvement really shows is in its fan service. Thanks to the better looking art, the fan service looks a lot better. Now we upgraded jiggle physics that compact with some very pronounced slapping effects, but I guess that's to add immersion. I said it before in the previous video, but I just need to reiterate. The fan service in High School DD is some of the better uses of fan service I have ever seen in an anime. And it gets better this season as while it's there, using conspicuous angles and whatnot, it doesn't take away from the anime. Hell, if this didn't have fan service, I don't think it'd be as enjoyable as it is now. Side note, I've heard that people don't like it specifically for fan service and all that adult stuff, and while this is valid, the same people go into it knowing what it's about and complain about it. In my opinion, that's just pretty cheap criticism. It's like complaining about a burger that has meat in it. You feel me? I personally used to hate fan service, but watching this series has changed my perspective on it. Damn, I'm over here defending fan service. Past me would be repulsed by me right now. Alright, back to the anime. Issei wakes up with a warning from Drake. Apparently, Drake has been sensing a pretty powerful presence around Issei lately, but is unable to tell where it's coming from. He cautions Issei to be on defense as the White One could strike at any moment. This is where we get some more dragon lore. The White One, aka the Vanishing Dragon, Albion. Drake and Albion are known as the two Sky Dragons and have been fighting for centuries. Transferring from host to host, the two along with their hosts are tied by destiny to always encounter each other and eventually fight. Issei is a bit uncertain about this, his conviction is starting to waver, but Drake assures him that if he does get stronger, women will flock to him for sure, fueling his drive to become the Harren King. The Okot Club has had its cleaning done and the crew are back to the usual. However, on the way to the club room, Issei and Asia notice a sealed off room with warnings to stay away. Whatever this is, we'll just have to find out later. The club members meet up with Kiba noticeably absent and everyone is worried about him. So Riaz gives us even more lore about him and his quest for vengeance. Turns out during a war centuries ago, Excalibur was shattered into seven pieces which were then reformed into seven entirely different swords with different properties, all of which bear the name Excalibur. The Holy Sword project tried to attune children into using the sword but they all failed with many losing their lives, and when the experiment was deemed a failure, the remaining children were to be disposed of. Kiba was the only one who was able to escape and at that moment Rias found him. Seeing his determination to stay alive and get revenge, she made him a devil. Hearing his backstory, Issei, Asia, and Koneko can only help but feel even more worried about Kiba. The next day, the club is visited by the two mysterious women from the church. This is Zenovia and Irina, and they both wield Excaliburs. They inform us that the fallen angels have stolen three of the seven Excaliburs and they are here in this town to retrieve them and don't want interference from Rias and her gang. And just as they are about to leave, Zenovia takes notice of Asia. She sees Asia as the same as all the other people of the church see her, as a heretic witch who betrayed the church. This cuts too deep for Asia, reopening some past wounds. She questions Asia's faith, asking her if she still believes in God, and Asia still does. Zenovia takes offense to this and offers to execute her right there, and Issei is not having any of that. 
Doing what he does best, he challenges them to an unofficial battle, and Kiba joins in, rather smugly too. The two ladies pull out their Excaliburs. Arena wields the Mimic Excalibur, which lets her change its shape to anything and Zenovia wields the Destruction Excalibur, which well, destroys. It seems our boys were all talk as they easily get beaten by the church girls. So not only were their bodies beaten, but their pride too. This loss only adds to Kiba's frustrations and so he temporarily leaves the group to go on a solo mission to destroy the Excaliburs. Still worried about their friend, Issei along with Koneko with the help of Saji, another devil in their school serving under the student council president and fellow high ranking devil Sona, come up with a plan to team up with the church girls and Kiba to help them find and dispose of the fallen angels as well as retrieve the Excaliburs. This is all behind their masters backs mind you. So that very same night we cut to the mystery man who's been summoning Issei frequently to hang out. He's kind of bummed cause Issei didn't get to hang out with him tonight but his loneliness is cut short when yet another mysterious man, this time with silver hair, shows up. Who exactly are they and what are they up to? We'll just have to find out later. Our unlikely crew are able to track down the Excalibur and freed along with it. They do a bit of battle until another priest steps in. This old man is Valpa and he's the one who spearheaded the Holy Sword project. Seeing him triggers Kiba's PTSD, but before the fight can go on the two of them retreat yet again, but this time the church girls as well as Kiba give chase. The rest of the crew want to follow suit but are stopped by their masters and then get punished for it. Meanwhile the crew that did give chase somehow got split up with Irina winding up alone where she has to fight Freed one on one but unfortunately she doesn't stand a chance. Freed is about to put her down permanently until someone stops him, his supposed master, a leader class fallen angel by the name of Cocobeel. They use Irina as a bait to lure the others to them. Here he declares destruction on their town and Rias herself. His goal is to lure Rias's older brother Sir Zex to take him down inciting a new war. And why is he doing this? Well, he's just bored of everything. He craves the violence and destruction and finds boredom in peace. That's a textbook villain right there. What's more, he's going against the wishes of the governor general of the fallen angels, Azazel, and acting out on his own since Azazel himself doesn't want war. So kicking off his plan, he starts with the destruction of their school. And the crew immediately give chase. Their goal is to defeat Cocobeel before Sir Zex can make his way to them. And chaos immediately ensues. Not only are they fighting a bunch of Cerberus dogs, but the priest Valba is at the back successfully fusing the Excaliburs into one for free to use. Things really start heating up when Cocobeel finally takes them on directly. Even with the combined powers of Rias and Akano, they are not enough to hold him back. And as they deal with him, Issei, Kiba and the rest face the priests. They too are having a difficult time going up against the reforged Excalibur. And this is when Valba hits us with a little bit of information about how the project actually worked. What they did was extract a certain gene from their subjects. Let's call it a holy sword factor. This gene extract is then condensed into a crystal which is then put into others which lets them wield Excalibur. Zenovia is shocked by this because the crystal looks exactly like the one the church did in fact put into Irina and she's horrified by that. Kiba is able to grab a hold of said crystal, the very one that contains the essence of his fallen friends, and by harnessing that power he's able to do something extraordinary. He achieves a balance breaker. So what is a balance breaker? It's a phenomenon that occurs when a sacred gear and their user fully synchronize. Their will goes against the very laws of nature and the universe which allows them to perform feats that should be considered impossible. It's basically hacks. Issei's cool transformation from the last season is also one of these balance breakers. And Kiba's balance breaker? Well he's able to create a sword that combines both holy and demonic energy, calling it the sword of betrayal. See what I mean by hacks? He's able to perfectly meld holy and demonic powers into a blade, two forces that naturally oppose each other. But this isn't just the end of cool swords galore as the Novia herself pulls out the legendary holy sword, Durando. And whoa mama that's a big sword. I mean just look at it. Uh, ahem. So yeah, the Durandal is a pure holy sword that is said to be able to cut anything, even reality. It's a sword so powerful that finding someone to wield it is nigh impossible, but Zenovia is the only one alive able to perfectly attune with it. Man, there is just so much lore in this anime. So with the two cool swords at hand, they are able to take down Freed and destroy the Excalibur. Seeing this feat gives Valba an epiphany. 
but before he can reach a conclusion, he's struck down by Coco Bill. That's right, he's still a threat. So they all try to stop him yet again, Issei transferring his powers to amplify Rias, but it's still not enough, even with more lightning from Akino. Coco Bill is sort of pleased with Akino's lightning. He mentions how her power is very similar to that of Barkio, another fallen angel leader. But the mention of that name only makes her furious. Apparently, whoever this Barkio is, she doesn't want to be associated with them. Turns out, that's her father. The fight continues but everyone is really starting to reach their limits. That is when Coco Bill lets slip a very important bit of information. God is dead. And God remains dead. And they have killed him. This review actually had me gasping at my screen. God along with the four great devil kings were killed during the three way war. So this brings the question, who have the Christians and the church been praying to? Where are all these blessings even coming from? That would be from Archangel Michael, who's been running the system all this time. As you can tell, this is the biggest shock to Asia and Zenobia. Issei had just about had it and monsters up whatever main character energy he has left to fight Coco Bill. With Rias promising him to let him suck her boobs if she wins, he's suddenly filled with a burst of energy. He's actually able to fight back Coco Bill, but just as it looks like things are going in Issei's favor, the fight gets interrupted. A mysterious being clad in white armor enters the battlefield. This is the Vanishing Dragon, and with no words, he attacks Coco Bill. Coco Bill retaliates, but the White Dragon puts him down with one of his unique abilities called Divine Dividing, which cuts the power of whatever he touches in half every 10 seconds and then transfers that power to the user. It's pretty cool contrasting abilities considering the Red Dragon doubles the user's power every 10 seconds. Albion, acting under the orders of Azazel, goes on to give a serious nerf to Coco Bill before taking him down in an instant. He's just about done ready to take the beating body of Coco Bill before Issei steps in. He's super pissed at Albion for basically cock blocking him and stopping him from getting titty time with Rias. And so their rivalry has been established. That's pretty much it for all the fighting. Things are finally starting to calm down, Kiba apologizes to Rias and the rest of the club, vowing once again to forever protect her right after he gets his own punishment. The school life is back to normal yet again, but this time with a new member. Zenovia, the holy sword user, joins their ranks as the second knight. Her finding out that God is dead was a big no-no by the church which led her to being exiled. This in turn has left her feeling purposeless. So with nowhere else to go, she begged Rias to take her in as a knight. You know what this means? One more potential addition to Issei's future harem. And this is where the first arc of the season comes to an end. However, that's before we get yet another reveal that the man who's been summoning Issei all this time to hang out is actually Azazel himself. Honestly, I just love how this anime handles foreshadowing, build up and reveals. Every big reveal that has been given to us has been set up in one way or the other from the first season so when the build up finally pays off, it doesn't feel like it came out of nowhere. Once again, I am blown away with just how well thought out this series is. I went from enjoying this ironically to genuinely being invested in the story. And the world building? Wow the world building. This is some of the finer cases of world building I have ever seen. Better than stuff like Naruto. It feels like we've been learning something new about the world with every episode, slowly easing us into this rather unique world. Things don't just happen, there is a certain logic and reasoning behind them. The system behind the angels, the devils, the fallen angels and the way each of them run things just works so well with a lot of them sharing underlying issues of trying to maintain peace in some way or form in order to preserve their bloodlines. The second season made me realize this silly little shonen about a pervert who wants to see boobs all the time is a lot deeper than it looks. And it's honestly a shame a lot of people aren't able to look past the fan service because there is a really good shonen in there. But I guess if you can't, these videos will sort of help you get the main gist of the series. Which, if you're enjoying so far, consider leaving a like and maybe subscribe too so you don't miss out on the next addition to this series. With enough likes, I'll even get more motivated to cover the next season. So alright, that's enough shilling, back to the anime. After all that crazy fighting, we get our obligatory pool episode. There isn't really a lot of plot heavy stuff that happens in here, but there are a few character related stuff that do happen. Akino is getting a lot bolder with her advances towards Issei and this has gotten Rias a bit jealous. Next, Zenovia has come up with a new purpose. She wants to experience the joys of motherhood but it can't be with just anyone. 
It's gotta be with someone with strong genes, and who else could that be other than Issei? That's right, she wants Issei's seed. After that, the club gets a visit from Ryas's older brother on business. He's scouting their school for hopes of hosting a conference in there soon. So while he's in town, they spend the night at Issei's house where the two men have a pretty interesting conversation. He gives Issei the idea that since he's able to transfer his power to other people, what if he transferred it into boobs instead? Would it theoretically make them bigger? This gives Issei an epiphany, but his mega brain is unable to understand what would even happen if he tries. This boy cracks me up. Then Issei meets the white dragon host Vali, a total edgelord. And we also get some more dragon lore. During the three way war, lots of other creatures were made to pick sides or face extinction, but the dragon race didn't cause they didn't want anything to do with the war. However, as the war broke out, two dragons, the white and red dragons, got into a fight that went on for years. Why are they fighting? Hell, even Drake doesn't remember why. But then the fighting became so ferocious that all the warring factions had to team up and fight the two dragons, which only angered them even more, leading them to attack the factions and even God too. Eventually they were stopped, sliced up into pieces and their souls sealed in humans as sacred gears. But that didn't stop them. Using their hosts, they would eventually find each other again and fight over and over again. Now that's pretty cool. Alright, the next few things that happened aren't exactly that big of a deal. We get introduced to a new character, one of the four devil kings, Seraphol Leviathan, who is also Sona's older sister. She likes to cosplay magical girls. We also meet Reyes' dad, and they have a swell time back at Issei's house. And Sir Zex leaves us with some final words. He tells Reyes it's about time she released her second bishop. It's surprising cause Issei and Asiya are just hearing about this for the first time. The second bishop was sealed away because Reyes wasn't strong enough to contain them, but now seems like a good time. Remember that sealed off room a few episodes ago? Yep, turns out that this is where the second bishop is being sealed. And it's finally time to release them. This is Gasper. Looks like a girl, sounds like a girl, but that is in fact, a dude. A socially awkward hikikomori who loves to cross-dress. That's not all as before he was turned into a devil, he was a half-human half-vampire. He's even got his own sacred gear. The forbidden Balor view that gives him the ability to stop time. But he can't control said ability, which is why he was sealed away. So they try to train him and get him used to the rest of the crew, and in the midst of it all, Azazel shows up to give them a few tips on training him. He's not doing too well though and eventually chickens out. This is when Issei gets a one on one moment with him. Gaspar is worried his pals will destroy those that are close to him, which is why he's so afraid. Issei can relate because he too is somewhat fears his power, but his desire to protect his friends is stronger than his fear. The two bond over this and become friends. Issei also admits to being jealous of Gaspar's power, because if he could stop time, well, needless to say, you know where this is going. Wait a minute, isn't this the plot of that one time stop hentai? Well, if you know, you know. Gaspar is kind of touched by this because nobody has ever been jealous of his power. All his life he's been alienated because of his power, so hearing someone say they were jealous was really heartwarming to him. Gaspar is inspired by Issei's pure horniness and is motivated to learn to control his power. The other girls of the club also help Gaspar with his social anxiety by putting a paper bag on his head to help him communicate better. And it works! After this, Issei is invited to a shrine by Akino where a very important figure wants to meet him. That being the Archangel Michael himself. Michael bestows a holy blade onto Issei, the Dragon Slayer Ascalon. Michael's reasoning for giving him the sword is simply because he wants to give Issei a power boost, in case of emergencies, and that he wants Issei to help in bringing together all three factions. Better to have him on their side than against them after all. Issei agrees and assimilates the sword into his gear, giving him a cool new upgrade. Issei does have a few questions for Michael, but unfortunately he doesn't have time and promises to answer them the next time they meet, which will be soon. After this, Issei and Akino get a moment together. He asks about Abdil and what her relationship with Barkio is. She reveals to us that she is in fact the daughter of the fallen angel leader. She was actually a half human half fallen angel before becoming a devil, leaving her with mismatched wings. She's been wanting to tell Issei about this since the moment she fell for him but couldn't find the courage because she was afraid he'd hate her since he has a bad history with fallen angels. You know, being catfished and killed by one after all. But Issei doesn't care about that. 
he accepts Akino for who she is, regardless of her lineage, hitting her with that MC Riz. Right there and then, she decides she doesn't mind being Issei's third, willingly throwing herself into his up and coming harem. Despite how much of a pervert he is, he's dumb as fuck and still doesn't seem to tell that the ladies want to get all up in his meat. And as luck would have it, Rhea shows up yet again, seething with jealousy. In that moment of insecurity, Rhea asks Issei, if Issei does dream of having a harem one day, would she have a spot in there? But Issei, still freaking stupid, is all like, nah, you're my master, you're way too good for my perverted pipe dream. That doesn't make her too happy. Despite everything and how Issei treats her, she feels so far away. It really makes you think, she's actually right. The way Issei talks to her compared to the way he talks to someone like Asia are completely different. Despite the fact he's all about Rhea's booby time, it still feels like there's a wall between them. A wall that Issei hasn't realized he's put up. Where their relationship will go from here, only time will tell. The day of the super important conference is here, all the big leaders from all the three factions arrive, Archangel Michael with Irina, Sir Zex with Seraphal and their retainers, Azazel with Vali, and Rias with the rest of the occult club, minus Gasper and Koneko. They're basically there to talk about the actions of Kokobil and his motivations, as well as finally make peace with everything and focus on rebuilding bloodlines. But things are cut short when the school is attacked by a mysterious group. They're humans with magical abilities. They call themselves wizards. They capture Gasper and force him to use his ability to stop time and wreak havoc on the conference. Time does stop, but the powerful ones are able to not be affected by it. Vali transforms and deals with the attacking wizards, while Rias and Issei teleport to go rescue Gaspar and Koneko. Just then, the one behind the attack reveals herself. This is Kateria Leviathan, a descendant of the first Leviathan. You might be confused seeing as she has the same title as Seraphol, but they aren't exactly related. The name Leviathan is just a title given to anyone strongest enough to claim it, and Kateria was the one who lost the title, which has made her super salty since she's a direct descendant of the first Leviathan. Azazel takes her on and knows that she's got a very peculiar aura about her, one that a devil normally wouldn't be able to possess, but she doesn't tell him much about it. I guess we will just have to find out about it later. Meanwhile, Rias and Issei are able to find Gaspar and Koneko, and with Issei offering his blood to Gaspar, he's able to fully release and take control of his powers, helping them nab the win and return to the main group. So now the big final season battle really starts. Everyone is throwing hands and showing what they're made of, and this is when Azezo pulls out something he's been working on for some time now. He's somehow able to create an artificial sacred gear akin to that of Issei's. The Downfall Dragon Spear, and he's able to balance break with it, transforming him into the Downfall Dragon, another armor. Not a cool name, but its design goes really hard. With this transformation, he's able to take down Kateria, pretty effortlessly too, yet he's not satisfied with its performance. Just as it looks like things are finally about to settle, Vali attacks Azazel, who is honestly not surprised about it in the slightest. Turns out Vali is part of a group called the Chaos Brigade, and that's Chaos with a K, led by the Ouroboros dragon, Orphis, who we actually saw a few episodes back conversing with Vali. Man, there are actually a lot of important names being slung around, so I totally understand if you can remember all of them. Well, there's more, as Vali is actually the descendant of the great devil king Lucifer, and thanks to the fact that his mother was human, he's a half-devil which is why he's able to become the white dragon's host. So he's so special, his existence alone is nothing short of impossible. The more we find out about him, the more he really does contrast Issei. He looks down on Issei, disappointed in the fact that this is his rival of all people. So disappointed that he claims he's going to kill his parents and then his friends so that will give Issei the goal of revenge. Issei is incredibly pissed by this and activates his balance breaker. The two fight, and this is the hypest fight in the season, nay, the entire series so far. And can we just take a moment to appreciate that their armor isn't rendered in CG? As you'd expect, Issei isn't doing too well against someone who cuts his power in half every 10 seconds. This does let him notice that Albion does have a sort of energy cap, when he reaches the limit, he disperses the leftover energy from his wings. This is when Issei gets the bright idea to transfer so much power into Albion that he overloads the dragon causing the armor to break. But Vali isn't done yet, he immediately reactivates his armor. And this is when Issei gets another bright idea. He picks up one of the broken pieces of Albion's armor, and with inspiration from Kiba, he attempts to absorb the white dragon's power. And he actually does! 
Behold the dividing gear. Albion responds too by showing off yet another ability. Honestly, they just keep one upping each other throughout this fight and I am here for it. The ability lets him have reality itself. Azazel then pulls off a galaxy brain move. He warns Issei that if Albion is able to have anything in reality, that means he's able to have Rias's boobs. The thought of that alone shatters Issei, a world where Rias has normal sized boobs? Impossible. Fueled by the power of Horny, Issei multiplies his power by a million and really wails on Vali. This scene was just as hyped as it was hilarious, but Vali is still not going down. He's about to show off yet another big move when, just then, another character storms into the battlefield. From his getup alone, you can tell who exactly he is. His name? Baiko. He's a descendant of Sun Wukong, the Monkey King himself, and he's here to get Vali. They have another mission at hand, to go fight the Norse gods. That's right, in this moment, the scope of the world just got 10 times bigger. As cool as this is, it's not really surprising considering everything else we've dealt with up until now has borrowed elements from different mythologies and religion. So Baiko leaves a valley and the battle finally comes to an end. And with it comes a new era of peace. Seeing as now is a good time, Issei makes a request of Michael. He begs him to let Asi and Zenovia be able to pray again. It's honestly really sweet, and this is when Zenovia falls for him. Honestly, this is some of the better harem progression I have ever seen. They don't just fall for Issei because he's the main character, despite all the perversion, he's really a good guy always looking out for those closest to him. He can be really wholesome and it's that wholesomeness that really draws the girls to him. We all know that every main female character will eventually fall for him one way or the other by the end of the story, but I guess it's actually nice to see the moments they do fall for him. Unlike most isekai protagonists that just attract women simply by existing. Anyway, things are back to normal for the occult club, however, Azazel has now joined them as the club's supervisor. He's going to serve as a mentor to the rest and train them to master their sacred gears. That's not all as Sir Zex has realized that the best way for Issei to get stronger is by being in the midst of women. So starting today, every female member of the club will be moving into Issei's house. The house that will soon be remodeled to accommodate all of them. And so, the season comes to an end. I was really blown away just how much fun this season was compared to the first. From the polish to the action and the world building, there was never a dull moment throughout the anime's run. This season alone left me even more invested in the story and eager to check out the next season. Where the plot goes from here, I literally have no idea, but oddly enough, I can't wait to see just how absurd the anime gets. If you still haven't been convinced to watch the series, I highly implore you to do so as you are seriously missing out. Anyway, that's it for this video. This has been your very favorite slice of bread. Stay toasty.